Okay, we're in Daf Kuf Mem Hay, um, and we were talking yesterday about the whole principle of when a marriage uh, betrothal breaks up. If it's the fault of the girl, because the girl either breaks it off or she dies, so then the Gemara had said that it depends on the minagamakom whether the heirs or her estate or she has to give back the betrothal kesef, the kesef kiddushin. But that's in a situation where the cause of the uh, blockage of the marriage is, is hers. But what if the cause is the man's? Either he breaks it off or he dies. So the Gemara had offered a svar yesterday that she shouldn't have to give back the kesef kiddushin. Her argument is, I'm ready to go to chuppah. It's not my fault that we can't get married. So therefore, why should I be penalized by having to give back the kiddushin? Okay, and of course, this is all in the, in, in the context of our discussion of this foreign idea of shushbinus, where there's <coughs> different families, like family A uh, contributes a gift and celebrates at the simcha of family B, and family B is obligated to reciprocate. So keep that in mind that we're still under this discussion. So the Gemara now says on the fourth line, Lema tenuli bali ve'esmach imo tanai. Even though we had suggested that this is a universally accepted svar, that a woman should not have to give back the kes of kiddushin when the husband dies, because she could say, give me my husband and I'll rejoice with him, what's well, not my fault, but perhaps this is a machlokes tanoi. Detanya hama'areis esaisha besula goyve masayim ve'almanamon. Now the Bryce is a little bit cryptic, but it says that if a man betroths a woman, normally the ksuva is not due until after the nisuin. If there's only a kiddushin without any suin, under normal circumstances, there's no ksuva. However, there are certain times when Chazal instituted, especially when the convention is to provide the ksuva upon kiddushin, that she should be entitled to a certain amount for her ksuva. So this is one such instance where, let's say, it was stipulated at the kiddushin that I'm giving you the ksuva. So upon termination of that kiddushin, let's say the husband dies, so then she's entitled, if she was a basula, to get 200. If she's an almana, she's entitled to 100. Makam shenagu lahachzer kiddushin machzirin. Makam shenagu shelo lahachzer kiddushin ein machzirin. Divrei Reb Nassim. And because the kiddushin has been terminated, it depends on the minhag whether or not she has to give back the kes of kiddushin. But Reb Yehuda Hanasi Omer, be'emes amru, makam shenagu lahachzer machzirin. Makam shenagu shelo lahachzer ein machzirin. And Reb Yehuda Hanasi seems to just be repeating the words of Rebbe Nassim. He just says, in truth, they said that you go according to the minig. Where the minig is to return, she returns. Where the minig is for her not to return, she does not return. So the Gemara's obvious question is, Rebbe Yehuda Hanasi Hainu Tanakama. What is Rebbe Yehuda Hanasi saying any differently from what Rebbe Nassim had said? Ela lav, tenuli baili ve'esmach imo ika benayu v'chisuri mechzer avahachiketani. So the Gemara suggests that really the machlokis is based upon this svara of when the husband dies and it's not the fault of the girl that the marriage cannot proceed, whether or not we say this argument or not. And there's a shtickle missing that we have to insert into the brisa as follows. So the first part is we're going to keep the same, that when a man betroths a woman and the stipulation is the ksuva starts from the time of Kiddushin, so the law would be as a basula, she's a first marriage, she's entitled to 200. As an almana, she's entitled to only 100. But that's only when the man was the cause of the termination of the process. Or like he backed out. But if she dies, then she's may, she may not, she's not going to be entitled, number one, of course, she doesn't get the ksuva because she's dead, so her estate does not get the ksuva. Um, and then the question is, does she have to return the kes of kiddushin? So, makam shenagu lahachzir machzirin, makam shenagu shol lahachzir ein machzirin. So then, if she's the, the one who died, so then it depends on the minag hamakam. The davka shemei sehi, avol meisu, ein machzirin. But that's only when she dies. But if the husband dies, then everyone would agree, says Rebbe Nassan, that she, no matter what the minog is, that she does not have to return the kes of Kiddushan. My time. 
Because Rav Nassim says we subscribe to this svara, to this argument, that a woman could always say, it's not my fault, I'm ready to go to chuppah. And therefore, why should I be penalized? And, and this is where the machlokis comes in. And Rabbi Huda Nasi's point is, no, it doesn't matter to me whether he dies or she dies. At the end of the day, whatever the convention of the place is. So even in a situation where he dies, sometimes she'll have to give back the kes of Kiddushin because I don't hold of such a svara that she could say, it's not my fault, so why should I be penalized? So the Gemara suggests this is the machlokas. So the Gemara says, lo, not necessarily. I could understand the Brisa differently. Dekule alma yecholo shetomar tenuli baili ve'esmach imo. Really, it could be that everyone in this Brisa, both Rabbi Nassan and Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, agree that when the husband dies, a woman does have a right to keep the kes of Kiddushin because she could say, it's not my fault. Udemishu kule amo lo pligi. So when do they argue? Ki pligi shemesahi. The only machlokas between the two would be when she dies. That's the machlokas. Vahacha b'kidushin l'tibu nitnu kamiflagi. And the machlokas is, what is the halachic status of money that is given for kidushin? Is the money an irrevocable gift? Is it complete? Does the husband forfeit it no matter what? Or, it is a, or is it a gift that is given to the wife on, upon anticipation or based on the anticipation that he's going to consummate the marriage, and if for whatever reason that never goes through, it's a revocable gift, and the husband can get it back. So this is the machlokis, that Rav Nassim sober kiddushin lav l'tibu in nitnu, that Rav Nassim holds that kesef kiddushin is irrevocable, so even if she dies, he never gets it back. And, um, and uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, just the opposite. Rabbi Nassim says that it's not irrevocable, it is something that he can retrieve, and therefore it depends on the minigamakam. When she dies, if the minig is for her, the family to give it back, they give it back. If the minig is not, then not. But the Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi saver kiddushin litibun, and Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi holds that it is irrevocable, and no matter what, uh, he doesn't get the kes of kiddushin back. So the Lord says, now wait a minute, if that's the machlokas, v'hamakam shenagu l'atzir matzirin katani. One second, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi in the Bryce is quoted as saying, that sometimes her estate does have to give the money back. So how can you tell me that according to him it's an irrevocable gift? So the Gemara answer is, So the, the Gemara says, no, the shtickle you have to add into the Bryce the, 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 according to this interpretation is that Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi was referring to the additional gifts above and beyond Kiddushin. In other words, Kiddushin, says Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, I hold that it's irrevocable. And therefore, even if she's, she dies and she's the cause of the termination of the process leading to the chuppah, mm-hmm. nevertheless, that money never goes back to the husband. What about the sivlonos? Now, sivlonos are the gifts that a husband sends to his bride after he's betrothed her. She goes back to her father's house, and then he sends her jewelry, wardrobe, whatever it is, in anticipation of getting married in a few months. Okay, but that definitely he's entitled to retrieve because, because that, he said, I only gave it to her because I wanted to see her wearing nice jewelry when we were married, husband and wife, and that's not happening. So that's where Rabbi Huda Nasi says it depends on the minog of the, of the place. Vahani tanai, kahani tanai. Now, according to the way we're interpreting the Mishnah now, that it's a machlokis whether kidu, the money of Kiddushin is irrevocable or not, um, that's like the following Machlokas Tanoim, the Tanya, Kadsha Bekikar, Vesula Goiva Masayim, Valmana Mana, Divrei Rebbe Meir. Again, the language is going to be cryptic until we explain it, so just bear with me. A man gives a woman a talent of silver for Kiddushin, and then for whatever reason, they can't move forward with the marriage. So according to Rebbe Meir, in addition to the talent of silver, she's also entitled to the money for her ksuva which is either 200 for a besula or 100 for a second marriage. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, besula goiva masayim valmana mana umachzeres lo esashar. Rabbi Yehuda says, no, she gets the money for the ksuva, but she has to return the talent of silver that she received for kiddushin. Rabbi Yossi Omer, kidsha be'esrim nosin la shloshim chatsoyim, 
Kitsha Bishloshim no Simla Eshim Chatzon. And the, Rabbi Yossi is the, is the most cryptic of all. He says that if he married her by giving her 20, then he has to give her 30 halves to make up the difference. If he married her with 30, he has to give her 20 halves to make up the difference. Now, what that means is you'll see in just a second. Just, just bear with me. But my asking is, so first thing where it says, before we get to Rabbi Yossi, what are we talking about? Elema Shemesa Mi Islak Suva. We can't be talking in this price about a case where a woman, the woman died, because when a woman dies, she's not entitled to ksuva payment. And Reb Meir and Reb Yossi both agree that she gets the ksuva. So the Ela Shemesu. So what's the alternative? That the man died? So Amai Machzeres Loes Hashor. The name of Tanuli Bailiva Es Machima. Well, then why would Reb Yossi say that she has to return the talent of silver? After all, we just established that everyone agrees that when it's the husband's fault that the marriage cannot proceed, a woman never has to return the Kesef Kiddushin. So why does Rabbi Yossi say that she has to return back the talents of silver? So Ve'ela, so let's, uh, the alternative is Ve'eshis Yisrael Shazinsa. Maybe neither of them died, but there was a termination or an interruption of the process because what happened was is that during the betrothal, this girl went ahead and had an affair. Well, you can't tell me that she willfully had an affair, because then how could Rebbe Meir and, and, uh, and Rebbe Yehuda say that she gets her ksuva? When a woman commits an act of znus, if she commits adultery, she forfeits her ksuva. So, and if she was raped, if it was non-consensual, so then why should the marriage have to terminate at all? The, the, the Brisa assumes that the marriage has to terminate, but in cases of rape, a woman is still allowed to proceed with her wedding. She's still permitted to her husband. So, but rather, says the Gemara, we're talking about a case where the husband is a Kohen. Special law is that when a man is a Kohen, even if his wife is raped against her will, uh, she's, not, she's not permitted to go back to her husband. It's a tragic thing, but that's what we're talking about over here. Uvekidushin litibu and nitnu kamiflugi. And therefore, what's the machlokes between Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yehuda as to whether she has to return the talent of silver? Is Kiddushin, that the money for Kiddushin, a, an irrevocable gift or not? Rabbi Meir sover Kiddushin litibu and nitnu, Rabbi Yehuda sover lav litibu and nitnu. That Rabbi Meir holds that it's an irrevocable gift, and therefore the talent of silver, even though it was given upon anticipation of a, a marriage, Nonetheless, it's irrevocable, and therefore she keeps the talent, plus she gets her ksuva. But Rabbi Yehuda says no. It's one thing to say that she gets her ksuva, but the whole purpose of that talent of silver was in anticipation of their, uh, the man uh, anticipates consummating the marriage. Now that he can't, he gets that talent of silver back. That's the machlokas. Now let's look at Rabbi Yossi. For Rabbi Yossi, misafkule ilitibu nitnu olo. Rabbi Yossi says, I'm not sure. It's a suffix whether the talent of silver should go back to her. And therefore, my position is it's Maman Hamutal Bisafek. It's and therefore Cholkin. They split the difference. So if he gives her a talent of silver, she gets to keep half of it and she has to return half of it. And therefore let's go through the math. The Hilka Kidsha be Esrim no sin la shloshim chatsoin, kidsha bishloshim no sin la esrim chatsoin. So the Rashbam does the math for us. The the and the reason why it's a little confusing is because we're switching denominations. There's a zuz and there's a sela. And a zuz is four times the, um, uh, I'm sorry, the shkalim, uh, sh- shekels are four times a zuz. So the Rabbi Yossi is using the z- shekel denomination and not the zuz denomination. And therefore he says like this, if he gave her 20 shekels for her kiddushin, which is really 80 zuz worth of silver for her kiddushin, he basically says to her, we have to split that, so you have to give me back 40, and 40 you get to keep. So basically we look at it as you have 40 on credit that I've already given you, and I owe you for the ksuva. Because you have the status of an almana now, I only owe you 100. But since I've already given you 40 on credit, I only have to give you 60 now, and that's the equivalent of, um, of 15, 15 shekels, which is the, the 30 halves. That's 15 shekels. 15 times 4 is 60. So therefore, he's got to give her 60. 
if he had given her 30 shekels, which is 120 zuz, he basically says to her, we have to split that, so you have 60 on credit. I owe you now 40, so he gives her 20 halves. 20 half shekels is equivalent to 40. So the math works out that he basically has to make her whole to, to the 100. Okay, Amr of Yosef bar Minyumi, Amr of Nachman, the kol makam shenagu l'achzir machzirin, that the bottom line is, going back on this statement, that whenever the minaga makom is for her to return the kes of Kiddush and she has to return, the tirguma naharda, this is applied to the city of Naharda where that's the minaga makom. Sha'ar bavel mai, but what about the rest, other Babylonian cities? Rabbi Rabbi Yosef, Amri Taravayu, Mohari Hadri, Kiddushi Lo Hadri. So these two Amoraim of Bavel say that only the dowry is returned, but not the actual Kes of Kiddushi. That always, that, that is considered irrevocable, and that's the minhag of all other cities except for Naharda. So um, uh, it's interesting because the word Mohar is different from the word Siblonos that we used before. The Rashbam says they both really mean additional gifts that are given after the Kiddushin. Siblonos are jewelry and wardrobe, and Mohar is cash that is brought into the wedding. Mohar Habasulos, that's right. Amar of Papa, Hilchasa, Bein Shemes Hu, Bein Shemes Sahi, Vahadar Behu, he says it doesn't matter whether he dies, whether she dies, or whether he decides to cancel the marriage, Mohari Hadri, Kiddushi Lo Hadri. In all of those cases, she does not return the Kesef Kiddushin, but she does return the dowry. But Hadra Ba'ihi, Afilu Kiddushi Nami Hadri. But if she calls off the, the wedding, she breaks it off. So that not only does she have to return the dowry, but she also has to return the actual Kesef Kiddushin. And, and uh, Amemar Amar Kiddushi Lo Hadri, Gezer Shema Yomar Kiddushin Totsim Bachosa. Amemar disagrees, and he says no. Even when she breaks off the marriage, you have to let her keep the Kesef Kiddushin, because if you force her to give it back, an onlooker will think that the marriage has been completely annulled retroactively. He was never married to her, and therefore he would be allowed to marry her sister. But that's not the halacha, because in reality he was married to her. And therefore, in order to demonstrate that he cannot marry her sister, we tell her that she can keep the Kesef Kiddushin. Ravashi Omar Gita Mochiachalea. Ravashi says, What are you talking about? Let her give back the Kes of Kiddushin. And if people want to think that she's uh, <clears throat> that her marriage was annulled, look, she's got a get. It, there's no way to think that her marriage is annulled if she was if she received a get. So that in itself is evidence that he can't marry the sister. So Bahad Ravashi Badusahi, the Ika the Shama Baha, Balo Shama Baha. But the Gemara's conclusion is, is that Ravashi is mistaken. And the reason why we uh, um, uh, say that she keeps the money is because if she were to return the money, it's true that she got a get, but sometimes people only saw one thing and they didn't see the other thing. Maybe, no, but maybe a person, an onlooker, didn't see her get the get. He only saw her returning the money. He's going to assume that it's okay for this guy to marry her sister, and bad things could ensue. Okay, let us go weiter. Shahashushbinos nigves bevesta. So the Mishnah had told us that Shushbinos, that this... Um, a gift that is given from one family to another when family B is making a wedding, family A presents it with a gift, is something that became a convention in Klal Yisrael to, to avoid impoverishing Jewish communities when everyone would be forced to give a gift. So what they would do is family A would present the gift to family B. A representative from family A would spend the whole chasana and sheva brachas with family B. And then that would generate an actual halachic debt that family B would owe money to family A that is payable upon family A making their chasana. So it's not just a nice convention, but it's actually halachically enforceable. And that's why if the head of household of family A dies, family B still has a debt that they have to pay back to the house uh, uh, um, that is payable when the next, when the next one of the kids of family A gets married. So Tanu Rabbanan, Chamisha Tvarim Nemru Bishushbinus. There are five halachas that were stated in relation to this thing called Shushbinus, this obligatory reciprocal gifting. So Nigves Bevesten, number one, it's collectible in Bevesten, meaning it's an actionable debt that if family A 
presented a gift to family B, when family A makes it simcha, they can actually sue family B and based in if family B refuses to reciprocate. Number two, the chazeres ba'onasa, the debt is only payable at its time, which means only when family A makes a chasana does family B have to pay. And ve'en ba'mishum ribis, and it's not subject to ribis, such that if family A, let's say, presented a gift worth $1,000, and family B reciprocates with a gift of $2,000, that's perfectly okay, there's not a problem of ribis. We'll explain why in a minute. Ve'en ha'shviyas misham tasa, furthermore, if Shemitah occurs between the time that family A gives, gave its gift to family B and the time when family A was making its own chasana, it does not, the debt is not uh, eliminated through the Shemitah. And number five is, Ve'en ha'bachor notel bav tishnayim. A firstborn, when, the, when that reciprocating gift goes back to the entire household because the head of household has passed away, the firstborn can't claim a double portion uh, in that gift. So let's analyze these five briefly. Nikves be based in my time, Kamil Vedamya. The reason why it's actionable in based in, and that family A can actually sue family B to pay back its debt, is because we view it as a debt. Family A lent family B a gift. It's, it's a funny terminology. But we, we brought all of this a gift to, the, to your chasana because we knew that you would reciprocate. And if you don't reciprocate, we can sue you. Um, net number two, ve'en ba mishum ribis, the lava daita da hachi yoivle. And if family B wants to give a larger gift than what family A had originally given, it's not a problem of ribis of interest, because family B is not compelled to give that amount. They're only giving it voluntarily, and it's therefore considered, that part is considered to be purely a gift and is not a payment of interest on the original uh, gift that family A gave. Number three, ve'en ha'shviyas mishantasa the lo karina lo yigos. The reason why there's no shemitah problems with it is because the debt does not become due until family A makes it simcha. And since family A is making it simcha after shemitah, shemitah only wipes out debts that are mature at the time when shemitah arrives. Since this debt has not yet come to, come to maturity until family A makes it simcha, shemitah does not wipe out that debt. And finally, And the reason why, when the, 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 the head of household of family A dies, and family B wants to reciprocate, they, as we learned in the Mishnah, they give it to the entire household, not just to that one boy, that one Yasam, who's getting married. So then the firstborn in that family cannot claim a double portion because a, a firstborn only gets a double portion of the assets in the household that are there at the time of death. Nothing. But if they come after the death, post-mortem, he's not entitled to a double portion. And this is something that's coming from family B, post-mortem. And therefore, he's not entitled to Pishnai. Amar of Kahana, Klola Dishush Binusa. Um, so Rav Kahana says the etiquette, so to speak, of Shushbinus is that Hava Bimasa Iboy Leilamesa that, you know, the, the, thing, the thing to bear in mind is, is that there's a, a symbiotic uh, um, experience that's taking place during this Shushbinus process. What I mean the symbiosis? What I mean is, is that both sides benefit. When family A presents a gift to family B, a representative from family A benefits because he gets to party for seven days and really gets to live it up and gets to eat well for seven days. So there's benefit to family A, even when they're giving the gift to family B. <coughs> so the halacha is that if a member of, now after family A has given its gift, shushbinus, to family B, when family A is making a simcha, as soon as family B, someone from family B is in the town at the same time when that simcha is being made, then it's family B's responsibility to come to the wedding. In other words, don't wait for an invitation. Iboy le lamesa. You've, you should know that you're automatically invited. You don't have to stand on ceremony. And shama kal tavla iboy lelamesa. Furthermore, if, let's say, you're outside the city and you don't know about it, but if you hear wedding bells because you're outside the city but the bells are ringing, there too you have an obligation to come. Don't say, well, I didn't know about it, so therefore I'm off the hook. No, of course, as soon as you hear family A's making a simcha, then you have an obligation to reciprocate. Lo shama kol tavla, iboy leila oduye. 
if a guy says, I was too far away, I didn't hear the wedding bells, so then it's family A's responsibility to notify family B that we're making a chasana. But if lo odoe, but if, the Bach puts in the words, but if family A neglected to do that, to invite family B, then ein lo alav ela tarumos uh, uh, islay, tar- but shlume mishali. So family B can have tainas. They can say, hey, wait a minute. How come you didn't invite me? If you would have invited me, I would have sent one of our, our, our kids from family B, and they would have been able to live it up for seven days and eat well. You should have invited us. Okay, you have a good time, but you still owe me the shushbinus. You still owe me the gifts. But the Gemara says, va'ad kama. But wait a minute. You have to do a proper accounting. When you think about it, let's say family... B is prepared to give a gift of $1,000 to family A as a reciprocation for their previous gift. But they also expected that someone from family B was going to be well-fed for seven days. That's certainly worth a significant amount of money as well. So if family B never got to go to the chasana, aren't they entitled to deduct a little bit of the gift from of that $1,000 to make up for the food that they didn't get to eat? So the Gemara says, yes. Omar Abaye, no b'nei genaza adzuza, I see b'kise achla b'karse. So the answer is yes. If the Shushbinu's gift was only going to be one zuz, then family B can say, well, one zuz of food is what we would have eaten anyway, so it's a wash, and we don't have to give you anything if you didn't notify us to come to the wedding. Because what a person puts in his pocket, a zuz that you put in your pocket just as easily goes into your belly. In other words, that's what it costs to feed a guy for seven days anyway. So there's no point in us giving you a gift if you owe that money to us anyway. If the gift was going to be four zuz, which is a significant gift, so then a family A can say, well, we were going to feed you, or family B can claim, with such a lavish gift of four zuz, we were expecting two zuz worth of food. And therefore we get to deduct two. Two zoos. We only owe you two zoos of a gift because you didn't invite us. And mikan ve'elach inish inish kechashivuse. And if the gift uh, of shushbinus that family B was prepared to give was more than four zoos, so then you have to assess it subjectively based upon the prominence and the importance of the person who was going to be coming to the wedding. If that person was going to come to the wedding as a very prominent aristocrat, and he would have been worthy of feeding him, let's say. Uh, you know, uh, X amount of uh, dollars of food uh, and, and fancy food, so then you deduct it based upon his social status and his importance. Tanu Rabbana. Asa imo bepumbi yubikash lasas imo betsina yacholomelo bepumbi esa imcha kedech shasisa imi. Now the whole point of this price is to teach us the following principle, that the reciprocation uh, is only required if family A is making the same kind of wedding that family B made a month ago. Family B says we're prepared to reciprocate, but only if the wedding is of the same level, of the same kind of wedding. So for example, and the Bryce now gives a number of examples. Let's say family B had made a very lavish public wedding, and family A is now making a chasana, but they're making it on, a, on the QT, they're making a private wedding. Family B can say, listen, we're happy to reciprocate, but if you're going to make a private wedding and you're going to serve pigs and blankets, as for, and that's the whole thing that our kid is going to get when he comes, forget it. We'll wait until you make a much more lavish public simcha, and then we will reciprocate. Okay? Similarly, let's say... Um, Let's say the, uh, the, 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 the family B had made its wedding a month ago, and they married off their son to a besula, first time wedding for both of them. So obviously that's a much more lavish wedding. Now family A says, well, we're, married, we're having our son marry an almana, so it's going to be a much more low-key wedding. So family B can say, you know what, we're going to pass on that wedding. When you make a big lavish wedding for one of your kids who's going to marry a besula, Invite us, and then we'll bring the shushbinus then. Asa imo bashnia ubike shlasos imo barishona yacholomer lo lechishetisa isha acheres esa imcha. 
Another example is in the other direction. Let's say family B a month ago made a wedding, but it was a second marriage. So again, it's not as big. But then family A is making a huge wedding. Family B now has the option to say, when your kid gets married a second time, we'll bring shushbinas, right? But the first time wedding, it's a little bit too much for us, and so we'll pass. And finally, another example is, is that let's say family B a month ago made a wedding where their son was marrying one wife, and now family A is making a wedding where the son is marrying two wives, like Yaakov marrying Rachel and Leah. So family B can once again say, you know what, we'll pass. When you're ready to make a single wedding, that's when, we're, that's when we'll reciprocate. Tanu Rabbanu. Now, related to this whole idea of public wedding, private wedding, Gemara now tells us some agadita having to do with um, uh, different kinds of Torah knowledge. Atir nechsin, atir pumbi, ze'ubal hagadot. There's a terminology that's applied to a person who's a Talmud Chacham. When he gets this kind of terminology, he's known as a master of agadita, of homily. Now, what is he called? Atir Nixon, wealthy of money and publicly wealthy. When a person is publicly wealthy, everyone can see he's driving around in a Maserati. So the reason that's comparable to a person who is publicly noted as a scholar. Now, privately, he may not be as big of a scholar, but publicly he's noted as a scholar. Why? Because when he gets up to speak in front of a huge congregation of people, he sounds eloquent because he has midrashic material and homily to present. When it comes to the more intricate uh, uh, um, technical aspects of Torah study, of the Gemara, he may not be as much of a scholar, but at least for the public, he's known as a scholar. Okay? Atir sloyim atir takoa zeu ba'al pilpul. When a person is a master of logic, so then he's called a person who has multi, uh, an abundance of coins or an abundance of oil, like the people of Takoa, which means that he has a, 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 a seemingly never-ending supply of logic that he can always rely on. When he hears an idea in the Gemara, he'll be able to contribute, always contribute something. And what we call such a person is you are always able to contribute because you're like a money changer who has a constant supply of coins, or like a person from Takoa who has a constant supply of oil. Atir mashach, atir kamas, zehu ba'al shemuas. There's another kind of wise man who is a repository of knowledge. He's like a walking encyclopedia because he has a lot of knowledge. The difference between the previous one is that he may not know a lot of data, but he's able to apply logic to whatever he hears. This person is, may not have a, a lot of logic, but he has a tremendous amount of retention of memory. And this person is, is compared to a person who is wealthy of things that he stores in his warehouses. That's what, what we call him, a person who's wealthy of, uh, because of the storage that he has. And hakol tzrichin l'mari chachya gemara. And when people say that everyone needs the master of wheat, or the wheat salesman, they're referring to someone who's a master of gemara, because he basically is assumed to have mastery over all of the things that we just mentioned, and he can supply everything. Now, Amar Rebbe Zeira, Amar Rav, Mai Dersiv Kol Yemei Ani Ra'im, he says there's a Pasuk in Mishlei that says that all the days of a poor man are bad, and the person who's of good heart is constantly at a party. Now, so what do these words mean? So he says the first part that says all the days of a poor man are bad, the poor man who's wretched and miserable refers to the person who studies Gemara. The person who's happy and partying refers to the person who only studies Mishnah. And the Rashbam explains, why, is you, why are you wretched and miserable when you study Gemara? Because you're constantly applying your mind and you're never satisfied uh, to get resolution until you really work really, really hard. And after a long day of learning Gemara, your mom is exhausted. You feel broken. When you're learning Mishnah, it's a machaya. You can, it's easy driving, it's smooth sailing, right? And it's a machaya. You can learn Mishnayas all day long. I'm not perspiring from the effort. And it's therefore, it's a machaya. It's enjoyable, right? Rava Amar Ibcha. Rava says just the opposite. 
he says a, a wretched poor man is the person who only studies Mishnah, and the person who studies Gemara is the person who's very happy and partying all the time. Why? So the Rashbam here explains, he says, because when you only study Mishnah, you don't have, you don't have the ability to come to resolution halachically, because the Mishnayas are filled with contradictions, and a lot of times they're not according to halacha. So just by learning Mishnayas, you're not going to know how to live your life. But if you learn Gemara, you'll be content knowing that you have a grasp on how, you're, how we pass in la halacha. Bahaina da Omar of Misharshiya, Mishmeh the Rava, Maidit Siv, Masiya Avonim, Ye Otsev Bahim, Bokeya Eitzim Yisach and Bam. He says, and this is consistent with Rava's teaching on a Pasuk in Kohelis that says that a person who hews stones will be sad from them, but a person who chops down wood will be warmed by them. So Masiya Avonim, Ye Otsev Bahim, Elu Bali Mishnah, Bokeya Eitzim Yisach and Bam, Elu Bali Talmud. The stone hewer refers, who's, um, who was sad through, uh, from his quarry work, refers to a person who only studies Mishnah, because he's hewing the stones of the Torah, but he's not getting any resolution in halacha. But a person who's the woodcutter, that refers to the person who studies Gemara, he gets resolution and is able to warm himself, so to speak. He's able to get, to apply this to his real life, because he has resolution halachically. Rabbi Chanina Amar Kol Yemei Ani Ra'im Zeh Sheyesh Lo Isha Ra'a V'tov Leif Mishteh Tamid Zeh Sheyesh Lo Isha Toi This you bring home to your wives so they'll bring, say this at the Shabbos table your wife will love you for it. Mm. He says the Pasuk which the, the Pasuk going back to Mishle all the days of a poor man are wretched this refers to someone who has a bad life. But if a person is constantly happy and rejoicing that refers to a man who has a good wife. And of course you say and honey you know that you, you know which part of the Pusik this applies to you, <laughs> of course. So Rabbi Yanai Omar, and you let her guess, okay. Rabbi Yanai Omar, kol yamei ani ra'im. And so Rabbi Yanai has a different interpretation. He says, all the days of a poor man are miserable. Ze istinis, the tov leif mishta tam is ze Rashbam explains if a person is fastidious, he sees a speck of dust or a little ant crawling along, he, he gets disgusted and he has to run away from it. So he says, that's a guy who has no life, right? A person who is not bothered by a, a little bit of dirt and a little bit of, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that in his environment, so he'll be happy. He can live with it. You know, some people are so fastidious, you know, if there's even like a little water spot in the restaurant on my fork, I'm gonna, I can't eat on this silverware, right? Or the little water spot on the glass, I can't drink from this glass. Guy's got no life. Right? Can't enjoy life. Okay. Rabbi Yochanan Omar, Kol Yemei Ani Ra'im Zeh Rachaman V'tov Leif Mishteh Tamid Zeh Achzar. Rabbi Yochanan has a different attitude. He says it's psychological. He says if a person is overly sensitive and compassionate, then he can't. He has no life. Because the moment he'll see a poor person, a homeless person on the street, he won't be able to go home and have a night, have a night's sleep. He'll be constantly thinking about this poor fellow who's out on the streets. And that's a guy who has no life. Who's a person who can sleep at comfortably at night? A guy who walks past a homeless person and doesn't think twice about it. Doesn't necessarily mean he's a good guy, but at least he'll have a happy life in this world because he'll be able to sleep without having to worry because he doesn't have that sense of compassion. Sometimes compassion is a liability, right? Now, V'Reb Yeshua ben Levi Omar, Kol Yemei Oni Ra'im Zeh Shedaito Kitsara, V'Tov Leif Mishteh Tamid Zeh Shedaito Rechava. Rabbi Shua ben Levi says what it means that a person is miserable because he's poor refers to a person who's very small-minded, which means that any time he sees someone else uh, succeeding, it, he gets jealous. Any time he sees someone who uh, feels didn't treat him right, he gets belitic, right? And he always he gets broigus. He always gets, uh, always gets bent out of shape. That guy has no life because no matter who he sees in shul, he's always going, oh, that guy did that to me, that guy did that to me. And he has no life. The person who has, is broad-minded and sees the bigger picture, he doesn't care what people say, he doesn't care what people do. Life is good, right? That's a person who is joy, joyous and has a good life. Now what about the, the going back to this Pasuk, all the days of a poor person are miserable? Is that really true? Even poor people get to have food for Shabbos and Yanta from the community chest. So why should, you should say maybe most of the days of a poor man are miserable, but not all the days. 
So the Gemara says, no. Kedush Shmuel, Damar Shmuel, Shino Ives is Techilas Choli. Shmuel says that if you change your diet one day, you can really throw off your whole uh, gastronom- gastronomical system and become quite ill. Um, and that's why we find that when people overdo it at a simcha, they, you know, they spend time in the bathroom afterwards uh, very unhappy. And the reason is not because the food was bad, but because their systems were not used to it. And therefore, poor people, even from Shabbos and Yom Tov, are miserable because they eat very, very uh, poor diets during the week. Shabbos comes, they have a piece of flesh, they eat the kishka and the cholent, and all of a sudden, they, uh, they got to spend the rest of the day in the washroom, right? So that's why even Shabbos and Yom Tov is miserable for them. Okay. So anyway, um, so now, and finally, Ksiv b'sefer ben Sira kol yemei anim ra'im, ben Sira oimer af leilas. Now the book of ben Sira is part of the Apocrypha. Ben Sira, according to legend, is the son of Yirmiyahu Anavi, and he wrote a book that contains both uh, in, in, uh, divinely inspired words plus words that are not divinely inspired but are just words of wisdom. And in his book, ben Sira wrote that not only are the days of a poor man miserable, but even the nights of a poor man are miserable. You know why? So he explained. He says, Bishval gagim gago, mimater gagim legago, berum harim karmo, me afar karmo likramim. He says, because a poor man lives in the worst places, and he works in the worst places. He lives because he can't afford a, a nice home. He will always live in the part of town that is the most depressed part of town the, the, as far as uh, elevation. So therefore, all of the other roofs, when it rains, their gutters will spill over onto his roof, and he'll get his, roof, his house will get flooded first. And when it comes to farming land, he always gets, he can't afford a nice, lush, valley uh, farmland. He, they give him the cheap farmland that is filled with cragged rocks on the hillside. So when he fertilizes his field and puts new soil on it, as soon as it rains, all of the, all of the, uh, the fertile soil runs off and goes into the, the, the wealthy person's field. So basically, he's never, he's never going to be happy because even at night, he's got to worry about floods in his house and about the soil running off on his farmland. And unfortunately, it's almost like a statement of the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Mm-hmm. And I'm sorry to leave you on such a downer, <laughs> but uh, that's the end of the Gemara for today. Rabbi Hanan, Rabbi Nakasha, Omer, Ratzah, Baruch Hu,